The Map of Statistics The land of statistics originates from the holy kingdom of probability. Probability is a field in mathematics that concerns itself with quantifying and profiling uncertainty and randomness, and giving it more structure, which could help make decisions over uncertain matters. In the center of the kingdom lies the garden of distributions. Distributions are probability main working tools. They are a way to classify the uncertainty and say, oh, this uncertainty has this shape, while this uncertainty has this one. The garden is only a civilized version of the wild forest of stochastic processes, inhabited by strange flora and fauna such as Markov chains, Brownian motion, Poisson process, and martingales. Stochastic processes are concerned with the evolution of uncertainty, most often through time. Think of them as more complex tools, which can help us model even more complex world phenomena. Statistics is the science of collecting, analyzing, and distilling insight from data about uncertain matters. Armed with the proper mathematical tools, we can go about applying them to data gathered from the real world. Statistical theory is the foundation on which this can be done. Since our data is usually incomplete, we remain uncertain and apply the tools from before. Statistical theory tells us the basic way to do this. It introduces concepts like statistic, without the S, likelihood, estimates, confidence intervals, hypothesis testing, and p-value. Some main topics which sometimes get courses of their own include maximum likelihood estimation and asymptotic theory. Most scientific questions boil down to comparing the difference or correlation between groups. For example, does the group that got the new drug was better than the group that didn't? Statistical tests are ready-made off-the-shelf solutions for common problems. They can be divided into parametric tests, like the z-test, t-test, ANOVA, etc., which make some assumptions about the nature of the uncertainty of the problem, and non-parametric tests, like Wilcoxon, Krushkal Wallace, Chi-square, etc., which does not, but in turn can be less powerful. When testing for many things, some difficulties arise. Mainly the probability of making an error discovery grows bigger. Multiple hypothesis testing concerns with how to fix that. Old methods, such as the Bonferroni correction, can be too strict and they control the family-wise error rate. Modern methods control for the false discovery rate and include Benjamini Hochberg and knockoffs. Bayesian statistics is a way to combine prior knowledge or personal beliefs with data. It differs from frequentist statistics which only accepts the data as a legitimate source of information. The main working tool to combine the beliefs with the data is Bayes' formula, posterior equal prior times likelihood divided by evidence. The prior represents the belief, the likelihood, the data. The posterior is therefore a combination of the two. The evidence is a usually hard to compute integral or normalizing constant. The computational burden of computing the integral of the evidence in the Bayesian settings helps develop advanced integration techniques in computational statistics. While statistics were employed before the invention of computers, most modern methods require them. Computational statistics concerns with how to use computers for statistics. Pseudorandom generation are a way to mimic randomness in deterministic machines such as computers. This in turn can be used for sampling, simulations, and bootstrapping. Advanced computational methods include iterative methods, such as Gauss-Newton or iterated reweighted least squares, integration techniques such as Monte Carlo integration, Markov chain Monte Carlo, and approximation techniques such as variational inference. Survival analysis or time to event analysis concerns with scenarios where we are interested in a non-negative quantity, like the time until death or time until some event. There are many complications in these kind of analysis. A major one is censoring. Censoring can be described as incomplete data that still conveys information. For example, in many cases, by the time our study ends, not everyone in our study will experience the event. We do know they survived at least until the last time we checked. And this information can be integrated into the analysis. The most known tools for conducting this type of analysis are the non-parametric Kaplan-Meier curves and a semi-parametric Cox proportional hazard regression. The establishment of causality is of great interest in many scientific domains. Does the new drug cure the disease? Does smoking causes cancer? Do carbon emissions cause global warming, etc.? Up until recent times, statistics have been quite shy about the topic, 
as very few tools existed to establish causality outside randomized trials. Since not all data can be collected this way, the question of causality remained largely unsolved. In the last 20 years, things have started to change. Causal inference is the emerging field of trying to establish causality in brave new ways. Going down this rabbit hole, you'll be sure to encounter directed acyclic graphs, confounders, two calculus, counterfactuals, and other strange beasts. Time series analysis deals with the analysis of time series data. A major complication of time series data is the high correlation between adjacent points, which restricts the applicability of many statistical models. Analysis can either be conducted on the time domain or the frequency domain. Many times the goal of the analysis is forecasting, the ability to predict the future based on the past. Think about values of stocks in the stock market or the price of oil. But time series analysis can also be used to model the present and the past. For example, time series data can answer questions like, are we in the middle of a recession? Or did our enemies recently conduct a nuclear experiment? That last question gave birth to the FFT fast Fourier transform algorithm by statistician John Tukey and mathematician James Cooley, which allowed the Americans to detect Soviet nuclear explosions with an accuracy of 15 kilometers. Popular time series analysis models include ARIMA, Garch, Profit, and more. Dimensionality reduction concerns with transforming i-dimensional data into low-dimensional representation, while retaining meaningful properties of the original data. High-dimensional space is very hard to work with, a problem termed the curse of dimensionality. To break the curse, we hope to find simple structures which are hidden from us in high dimensions, but can be uncovered if we project down into lower dimensions. Linear projections include principal component analysis, or PCA, and nonlinear projections include kernel PCA, TSNE, autoencoders neural networks, and more. Closely related is sparsity. Sparsity is an emerging field in the age of big data. It is becoming more and more the case that we can measure many different features, sometimes even more than the number of observations. Think about gene mapping or social networks. The amount of information per unit of observation is huge. With too much information gathered from not enough observations, the sparsity assumption is the hope that only a small part of the information is actually meaningful, that the world is not as complex as it might first appear. One of the famous tools used to uncover sparsity is the lasso. An important development in recovering sparse signals is compressed sensing. Some of its applications are saving lives, for example, by speeding up or allowing for greater detail MRI scans. Sampling and design of experiments are concerned with the way we collect data such that the statistical analysis is valid and most effective. Sampling is a way to gain information about a population using only a small set of it, as creating a population census is usually too costly. In order for the conclusion we draw from the sample to be valid, there are rules to follow and challenges to overcome. Designing experiments is aimed at optimizing an input-output process where the researcher can carefully choose the most effective input values and observe what output they will bring. This again assumes that the experiment is costly and we want to optimize the experiments such that they give us the most insight at minimal cost. This is closely related and almost identical to active learning in the machine learning field. Once our model gave us an answer, how do we know what to do with it? Statistical decision theory is concerned with translating the answers from our analysis to an actual decision on the problem at hand. This is usually done by defining some loss or utility function which are affected by the actions that we can take and coming up with decision rules that minimize the risk. You can think of it as a bridge between statistics and game theory, which can also involve a lot of Bayesian statistics. Sometimes we assume a statistical model where some quantity of interest y is related to other predictor or predictors x by some formula which includes noise or uncertainty. This is called regression and is one of the biggest statistical tools available today. It is used for both inference and prediction. Inference is to say whether a certain predictor influences the quantity of interest. For example, does smoking increases the risk for lung cancer. And prediction is to give the most probable value of the y given an x. For example, given that I smoke, what is my life expectancy? Regression can be broadly divided into parametric models, which include linear models, generalized linear models, and nonlinear models, and non-parametric models, through some regressions are semi-parametric or mixed. 
Parametric regression assumes some function that connects the y and the x and some distribution for the noise. Linear models is limited to a setting where the variable of interest is continuous and unrestricted or can be transformed into being such. The function is linear and we often assume the noise is of normal distribution. Generalized linear models is a framework of mathematical analysis that extends the formulas through some transformation function and the noise to other distributions. GLMs include binomial regression, Poisson regression, gamma regression, and more. Nonlinear models extend the function to any nonlinear one. Neural network regression are a form of parametric nonlinear models. Methods to solve include iterative methods and gradient based methods. Nonparametric regression avoids any assumption and focuses only on the data. Kernel regression is a form of a fancy moving average regression. Other methods include local regression, smoothing splines, Fourier and wavelet regression, Gaussian process regression, regression trees, k-nearest neighbors, and more. In logistic and multinomial regressions, the output can be interpreted as probabilities of being in a certain group or class. As such, a close relative of regression is classification, where we predict the class of some observation. A simple way to turn logistic regression into classification is to use some threshold, say 0.5, and give the class 1 if the probability is above that and 0 if it's below. There are of course numerous other classification algorithms which include linear discriminant analysis, support vector machines, k-nearest neighbors, classification trees, neural networks, and more. Another problem that often gets bundled together with regression and classification is clustering. In clustering we try to divide the data into distinct groups or clusters. Methods that can do so include k-means, expectation maximization, density-based algorithms such as dbscan and more. Density estimation is another common task. Sometimes we wish to estimate the distribution from the data. The simplest way to do so is with histograms. A somewhat more sophisticated version of that is to use kernel density estimators. Neural networks are so multi-purpose that they can also be used here. And these specific types of density estimators are called neural density estimators and include mixture density networks, and a family of methods called normalizing flows. Not all questions of statistics are theoretical and math-oriented. Much of the works of statisticians and data scientists involve more practical issues, such as collecting data, cleaning the data, exploring the data, and visualizing the data. This can take up a lot of time and requires experience and expertise to be done efficiently and well. There are, of course, much more topics, fields, subfields, and niches. The land of statistics is vast, but it's time to talk about how it relates to its surroundings. Statistics is a branch of mathematics. As such, it relies on many topics in math, like linear algebra, calculus, set theory, measure theory, and functional analysis. It is also closely related to another branch of math called optimization, as many of the algorithms in statistics boil down to optimizing some objective function. As such, you will often encounter terms like convexity, Lagrangian, or duality, and could benefit from taking courses and expanding your understanding in linear programming, convex programming, quadratic programming, combinatorial optimization, and multi-objective optimization. As most of statistics nowadays is done on computers, it is also closely related to computer science, which also branched out of mathematics, but gained its independence some decades ago. Understanding how computers work, what are data structures, how basic algorithms behave, the notion of complexity, databases, as well as programming languages such as R, Python, and the recent Julia are all important for the application of statistics. Of great importance in computer science is the field of machine learning, which cover a lot of the same ground found in statistics. There is a shift of focus, however. While statistics distill insight from data which allows us to make decisions, Machine learning automates the process and places the decision-making in the hands of the machines themselves. This allows to use them for all kinds of tasks. In addition, machine learning also concerns itself with allowing machine to understand text, sounds, and images in the way humans do. Natural language processing is a subfield concerned with allowing machine to understand sounds and texts in order to perform different tasks, such as machine translation, understanding voice commands, text summarization, etc. For vision, there are convolutional neural networks and other data-based or machine learning algorithms which allow machines to perform tasks such as face recognition, self-driving cars, classifying images, etc. 
They are added to a whole bunch of non-machine learning algorithms in the computer vision field. In reinforcement learning, you treat a computer as an agent who takes actions in an environment in order to maximize its reward. It can be used to become good enough in games to beat the world champions, like in chess or Go, but has numerous other applications as well. Finally, much of statistics was and still is driven by questions in other sciences, like physics, biology, economy, astronomy, etc. Some great statistical methods were devised specifically as part of a much larger science problem. For example, the Metropolis Hastings MCMC algorithm was devised by physicists for problems in physics. Rejection ABC and MCMC ABC were devised for problems in genetics. The Arch Garch model was developed by an economist who even won the Nobel Prize for his discovery. Least squares was devised by Gauss for problems in astronomy. And there are many other examples. I want to end this video with a disclaimer. First, I am not an expert, just someone who finished his master in statistics. Some of the places in this map I know very little of, so take this with a grain of salt. Second, this is my personal view of how to divide and arrange the different fields of statistics, and it's by no means the only way to do so. Third, I am sure there are many other topics and fields. Some I may forgot, some I maybe didn't even knew of, some I may have chosen to purposely ignore for various reasons. And fourth, many if not all the fields are interconnected, and dividing them is somewhat arbitrary. Even though I call this a map, don't take the divisions and definitely not the distances too seriously. I want to end by giving a shout out to the wonderful illustrator who I commissioned for this map. Her name is Julia and you can check out her Instagram and her portfolio, which I will link in the description. I also want to give a shout out to the animator Miguel, who did a fantastic job. You can check out his Fiverr account linked below. Like always, I hope you enjoyed this video and see you in the next one.